think that, that woman's <coughs> I think Adam is doing the introduction, so we'll wait for Adam. There he is. I will, uh, there's more people coming, so right. I will introduce you. Hi, Jeff. Are you going to watch from there? <laughs> Wait for the rest. The rest of the people that. Okay, well, we've waited long enough. I think everyone that's going to be here is here. Yeah. So thank you for coming out to the very awkwardly named DDD CKRS ES meetup. Uh, it's an awesome meetup that I started about a year ago because I didn't see anything in Vancouver that could offer the same thing. And it's amazing to see so many people come out every single week to learn this stuff learn about microservices, to really push architecture forward, uh, to see all the benefits. I know we have some security experts here today, <laughs> hiding in the corner over there, straight from California. And by the way, I love your Raum Patrolia Orion t-shirt. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I wore it just for you, Robert. Anyway, uh, so yeah, huge amount of uh, advantages to working with software this way, and so happy to see people from all walks of life, security, business, development, QA, uh, project management, just tons of benefits to all of this. Uh, I've never found a better way to write software. I'm happy that you're here to see this. I started a company called Adaptech Solutions with these two Roberts involved as of last year and a whole room in the back of developers just working on software using this method. So we're happily, I guess, 15 of us now, I guess, roughly, I don't know, 14, 10. Some advisory board as well across the globe. Uh, check out our site, adaptexsolutions.net. Uh, today is a very special day because we have fresh from Germany, surprise, surprise, Sia, who's moved from Berlin, is it? Hamburg. Hamburg, Hamburg, great, okay. You're from Berlin, okay. <laughs> Mark's from Berlin, Hamburg. Uh, and uh, he is uh, concentrating on serverless stuff in the Microsoft space, so we're very pleased to uh, have Sia explain things from that perspective and how it plays to CKRS and ES. CKRS is our magical circular architecture, which Sia will get into. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Sia. Not all these slides are very light, so they're. Sure. Because be that way it might be better for the uh, screen. Oh, that's nice. Right. Yeah. Better? Yeah, I agree. I think so. Okay, there you go. <coughs> okay. Yeah, hi, and thanks for all of you coming to this talk. Um, actually, it's the first time I'm talking about serverless with CKRS and event sourcing, and it's the first time that I'm talking in English in front of a uh, native speaking uh, audience. So uh, forgive me if I do some <laughs> mistakes. Okay, uh, so serverless. Uh, before we start, a uh, quick question. Who knows what serverless is? Or who thinks he knows what serverless is? <laughs> okay. Who uses serverless today? Awesome. AWS? Lambdas? Yeah, Lambdas. Lambdas. Because right. often when you talk to people, uh, we had this before, it's always like words like serverless, microservices. Those are all buzzwords, everyone has heard them, but no one really understands what it is in the end and what is the benefit out of it. And we're talking about uh, DDD and how people are like, okay, so DDD is nice and stuff, but what is it? What do I get from it? Like, why should I use it? Why should I go change the paradigm? Um, normally, I do this talk together with Yannick, uh, who isn't here, he is in Berlin. Um, since I'm on his slides too, we, we share the slides, to be honest. Uh, and these slides are from the 
normal serverless talk. Um, they're not very specific. These are just to get into serverless and what serverless means and how it works and what's the difference. Uh, and we have a great location here um, because we're going to start with something that says co-working space. So normally someone starts a company or wants to start a company, right? They normally just want to work, especially developers. They just need a laptop. They want to sit down. They want to uh, start on and just put in some code and get to, to the product. But often if someone thinks of a new company they want to start, often it looks like this. I want to have a big fancy building with everything in it. Um, but having a big fancy building has some downsides, right? You have to take care of infrastructure. We need someone to manage the uh, green. We need someone uh, who takes care of uh, infrastructure like uh, power, internet, and other stuff. But we, what we wanted in the first place is, actually we wanted just to work. We wanted just to sit down somewhere and work. And when we look at software, it's often like this too, right? People are asking for a feature. We have in mind, okay, there will be a little bit of database there, a little bit of messaging there, a little bit of monitoring and a web server. But it should all be about the feature, right? So the biggest part should be a feature. So when we start as developers to work, we end up like this, right? <coughs> Future becomes small and everything else becomes big. All the infrastructure, everything we need to do, everything we have to take care of that we have to take care of every time. Kind of a ceremony, right? And ceremonies are annoying for developers. We just don't like doing all the stuff over and over and over again. This is why smart people started doing things like microservices and Docker where it's put certain things that are always the same into a container, right? So we just deliver our application inside a container. This container can be deployed somewhere and it runs. Um, and we get rid of things like, hey, it works on my machine, but it doesn't work on a server. Now, um, just to have a comparison. So what I said first, we want to work. A lot of people have first in mind, hey, I want a big company, right? This would be kind of a monolith. Um, that I have a big building, I have to take care of everything myself. This goes kind of in the direction of um, <coughs> infrastructure as a service, where I have to take care, or even before that, when I have my own data center, I have to take care of my data center, of, of all the infrastructure that comes with it, I have to take care of the VMs and everything running inside of it, and so on and so forth. And then microservices, um, it's kind of an office where I can hire, right? I can hire my own office inside a building, um, but I still have to take care of uh, uh, infrastructure like having someone at a desk or uh, taking care of the internet that it is available, that it is there. And the third place serverless is really kind of a co-working space. I only walk in and use everything that is there, the infrastructure is there. I just walk in with my laptop, sit down and start working. And when I leave, I only pay the time that I spent there. And with serverless it's the same. You only pay the time that your function is really running, that you really spent on the machine and not the whole VM for a whole month, even though you just need like 10% of the time, right? <coughs> So serverless is the new thing. <coughs> when we look at um, this in a, in a VM app services functions in Azure, um, this would be like this, right? Where I have my VMs, there I can do whatever I want. I can install the OS that I want, I can run the software that I want, I can manage everything. But I have to manage everything. On the other hand, the app services, uh, it's a pass abstraction platform as a service, so I get the platform, um, I just need to bring my own application. But I still have to do all the ceremonies for my application again, right? Uh, setting up the database, setting up um, the connections, making sure the apps can connect to each other and talk to each other. So when it comes to functions, Azure functions, this is all provided to me. 
So the platform that I start on has already the connections to the database. It has already uh, everything set up so I can just start and do it. Um, this means we can focus. We can focus on what we want to do, right? We can focus on our implementation. We don't have to take care of all the other things that we had to take care of. <coughs> Sorry. Um, looking at functions, that's kind of what happens. Uh, important is this trigger part because we are now at a DDD CRS ES <laughs> meetup, so um, what does a trigger mean? A trigger is actually nothing else than an event-based trigger. So some event happens, and then I want to do something. In CRS, it would be a command comes in, now something happens, right? Or a command comes in, which creates an event. The event itself is stored in the event store, and this might um, trigger another processing to happen, another process to, to run. And those bindings that we have here, these are kind of what I was talking about that the database is already there. I can use bindings to make sure that as soon as my function starts, everything that I need is there. My connection to the database is there, uh, my connection to, I don't know, uh, a lot of people use WebSockets, for example, to update websites. Uh, there's a nice thing from Microsoft that is called SignalR. SignalR listens to service bus topics, so <laughs> I could write into a service bus topic and my website will be getting the message that it needs to update. Or another thing would be notifications <coughs> on mobile devices, where I send a um, quiet notification so that the app knows it has to update, what uh, actually the cu well, or the customer seeing any badge at the, at the top of the screen. And what also can, or what happens on, on the function side, and this is why serverless is so powerful, as soon as an event is triggered, as soon as a trigger is triggered or fired, um, <coughs> a new instance of this function is started, right? So let's say I have function one. And function one is <coughs> uh, runs because uh, an event happened. Um, and before function one is done, another trigger is fired, right? A second function is started to do the same thing. I can also control like where is function two writing to. Maybe it writes to another output than function one, depending on the event that was coming in. Right? <coughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. Let's look at the function apps for themselves. So I can write functions in C sharp, F sharp, JavaScript, Python, batch, PHP. Uh, actually, I could tell them to run some exe that I give them. Uh, but that's not so good supported. <laughs> so for now, the best support you get is for C sharp, F sharp, and JavaScript. So Node. Um, and it runs for JavaScript, it is even ES6. For C Sharp, it's just yesterday they released a new version where C Sharp <coughs> 7 features are available. So it's pretty up to date. And it's running Node 6.5 <coughs> for those who are wondering. So, hosting plans there are different hosting plans. Um, this is who, yeah. Questions. Yeah, sure. Like, how much of the .NET framework is available to you in the functions? It's 4.7, uh, 4.6, sorry. The full. Mm -hmm. It's a full .NET framework available, <coughs> and it is more C sharp script than C sharp. Um, but, there is a but, um, they just released, like, a month ago, they released a new feature which is called uh, pre compiled. Um, C sharp functions. So I can write C sharp functions on um, <coughs> C sharp script and pre compile them and let the function just execute something out of my assembly instead of just writing C sharp script. Yeah? Sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, Ask questions, guys. Get, Don't wait to the end. You get packages. Then. Yeah, you can use every new get package. You can use node packages, new get packages. Um, you can. There is, you can Actually, you can choose if you want to have them downloaded per function app or just per function. You can uh, mix and match it how you like. 
but it would be used for pre-compiled functions. No, you can use it even with the C sharp script part. So with download on every startup? No, it will be downloaded as soon. So when you change something and you save, he will realize, okay, there was a change and download the packages. <laughs> but um, this is right when you do it with C sharp script or even with Node. When you, let's say you're importing a node npm package that is like huge because it has like hundreds of dependencies or whatever. Your cold start time is a bit longer. Right? Yeah. We'll get to the limitations uh, at a few other slides further. Okay? Okay, hosting class. <laughs> Well, actually, one of the limitations we will talk about is in the hosting plans. So there are different hosting plans. Um, whoever worked with Azure so far knows from app services that there are different hosting plans. So I can choose like what machine size is behind it, like how big is it, how many cores do I have, how many uh, memory do I have. But there is also something that is called a consumption plan. Consumption plan is like a big huge plan uh, offered by Microsoft it's hosted by Microsoft and it is able to acquire to, to uh, allocate the resources that you need or that your function needs at a time when it runs so in the in the consumption plan your function can uh, kind of run parallel like in millions and billions uh, of times right so it can scale out with no limit. Actually, there's a difference to AWS Lambdas because they can only run 300 in concurrent. Um, those can scale out in uh, unlimited kind of in a consumption plan. In a normal app service plan that you choose yourself, they can only run as l much as they have resources. So when you're at the end of your resources, you can't spawn a new function. So Which makes sense. Sorry? SAP HANA? Sorry? The SAP HANA Cloud? What about them? <coughs> Is that similar? I don't know. I haven't looked into SAP HANA. Sorry. Yeah. But um, <coughs> what we had is uh, Yannick had an issue. So he uh, wrote some uh, function that was uh, kind of self-calling itself. So it was a recursive function. And he started it on Friday <coughs> evening and it was just grabbing 400 records from, 400,000 records from the database. So not really much. And he was wondering why it's still running. And then it was Friday evening, he was like, okay, I will go home and Monday I'll come back. When he came back, he saw like it is still running. And um, looking at the logs, he could see that 3.5 billion uh, instances of the function were running, right? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so is he bankrupt now? Yeah. Kind of. <laughs> when, when I show you in the end what the function, what, what the runtime of a function costs, it's like, this is crazy because he paid 2,000 euros just for this weekend. Doesn't sound like much, but if you see in the end the calculation, you will see that this is a lot. Okay, uh, so hosting plans also, um, there's a limitation with it. <coughs> So when I run on a consumption plan, there's a limitation of max five minutes for a function to run. If a function is still running after five minutes, it will be just um, kind of terminated, right? Um, which makes sense because this is a hosting plan that is available for everyone, so people would like to, to have some space left or some resources left. On the other hand, if you run your own hosting plan, so if you uh, have your own hosting plan, there's no, uh, no five limit limit, uh, five minute limit. Do you How to say? Do you get notification before it uh, terminates? No. no, it just terminates. Well, honestly, a function that runs longer than five minutes, there is something wrong with the function. But this is also something that. Um, where Yannick and I have different points of view on it, but I think if you have really a function that runs longer than five minutes, it's more than a function. Then you brought your whole thing in and you're like, okay, now just let it run on the functions. Yeah? Well, my, my issue was when I was in the is that I was running through some media processing. Sometimes my, my media processing is way more than five minutes. Sure. I had another issue with the functions that you can go up only to 1500 gigabytes of RAM. 
perfect. That changed. Uh, I don't know when you tried it, but that changed. Okay. Um, especially, so looking at a normal hosting plan, you can have a hosting plan where you have resources like up to 14 gig of RAM and eight cores or something. If you run this on Azure Stack, for example, then you're really open to whatever you have there as hardware, right? So whatever hardware you have there, you can say, oh, I would like to have like 64 cores and 500 gigs of RAM or whatever. But this is only on Azure Stack. That is coming mid this year, I think, summer this year. But um, media processing, there are other services in Azure for media service uh, for media processing. I'm there not are. sure if they because I'm not into media processing AMS at all. There. Yeah. It's uh, stupidly expensive. Oh yeah. So this is why I don't do that. I'm not sure if this one was made for media processing, but maybe you can junk it. You can junk it into separate yeah. smaller things and then like r let them run like a hundred of them or a thousand of them or whatever. Yeah. Maybe this is a solution. I'm not sure because I have no clue about media processing, sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, serverless, yeah, well, functions is serverless, that's what we talked about, so I get everything that I need just to run my app. We'll see in the demo later what it really means. Online editor, um, this is something cool, you get kind of almost a full featured Visual Studio Code in a browser. But uh, we'll see that later too. Okay. okay, triggers. So there are HTTP and webhook triggers. So I can say my function starts on an HTTP call or a webhook is called. Um, storage, uh, a file is uploaded to the blob storage <coughs> or some message is put into the queue, uh, queue storage. Event hub and IoT hub. Um, does someone know event hub or IoT hub, Azure event hub? This is pretty cool. This is a pretty cool thing. It's kind of a streaming queue, so it's like a queue. I can put in messages, but the messages are um, stored. So I can say I have a retention of seven days, and after seven days, they're even stored on uh, Blob Storage. And if something went wrong, I can go like and <coughs> say, "Hey, you know what? Please fire every event in that event hub again from." Seven days before. So right? it's, like Kafka or or it's, it's a Kafka. It's Kafka yeah, and Kinesis. Yeah. Yeah, okay. The difference between Event Hub and IoT Hub is the throughput. Uh, IoT Hub is made for IoT and they're using it these days for um, automated cars. So it does a throughput of billions of uh, requests per second or messages per second. So they say, I've never tried. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I can have also service box uh, topics um, or a service bus queues. Um, the, the nice thing about service bus topics is like I can have multiple consumers on the same topic picking up the same message. Uh, whereas on a queue, as soon as the message is read, uh, it's gone. Um, <coughs> and I can also trigger by email. I can say, hey, whenever an email comes in, run this function. <laughs> right. um, Bindings. This is something that you don't get with AWS Lambdas, the bindings. Uh, so I can do bindings in Azure Functions. I can say, hey, uh, as soon as my function starts, please grab me some data from a table storage, oh, sorry, from a table storage or from a blob storage. So let's say we have an HTTP trigger, right? And in the HTTP call, uh, either in the payload of the body or in a URL, there's a name of a file that I need to grab. So I can use a binding and tell him, okay, as soon as the function starts, get me that file with that file name that is coming from the URL and give it right into my function so I can start working on this. And this works perfectly good. Same works for uh, external FTP file. Actually, the external FTP file is also triggered. I can say, trigger my function whenever some file is uploaded to an FTP. It will automatically look at the FTP all the time, and uh, you don't need to install anything or something. You just give him the FTP credentials, and as soon as the file is uploaded, he will trigger the function. So what, what about faxes? 
<laughs> you well, you mentioned you email and FTP. So yeah, you could. Waiting for faxes. <laughs> oh, there's still a lot of people using FTP. You wouldn't believe it. Um, no, but you can. You can actually. What you could do is like fax to email and. Then, no, uh, right. But yeah, and a lot of people still using FTP. But this external file goes even further. It's FTP is just one example. It does Dropbox. It does um, UNC paths. Uh, whatever it is, right? External table is like um, something like I have a table. It is not a storage table, but it is like a SQL Server table or Oracle database table or SharePoint table or Google spreadsheet table. Whenever something happens there, please uh, trigger my function. Or in this case, in binding, go there and get get some data. And DocumentDB, which is the Azure way of MongoDB. It's a document store database. Outbindings. Yeah, I can write to a blob, to a table, to a queue, event, and notification hub. Uh, notification hub is a nice thing where you can say, send this notification out, and Azure takes care that it goes with the right payload to the right device. Because there's a different payload for Android, for iOS, for Windows. They figure out themselves, okay, this is a Windows device, so I have to send this payload, this is an iOS device, I have to send this payload. It's really nice that it works even with the Chrome browser. You know the notifications that you get in Chrome? Uh, it even works with that one. External files, so I can write to FTP <laughs> if I want to. Uh, external table. SMS and email, I can tell them just to send an SMS or an email. To be fair, we have to say, so SMS and email, either as a trigger or as an outbinding, is done by Twilio and Smart Grid. So you need a Twilio or Smart Grid account uh, to that's make this That's cheating. Yeah, it yeah. kind of is. <laughs> right? um, yeah, and then service bus for the opt. OK, so next thing would be demo. Before we jump into the demo, first, uh, for the guys who have been here for a few times, uh, there is a Nota demo that uh, Robert does with the others, right? Um, about none of the above, yep. right? Yep. And I picked it up kind of uh, to, to put it into my demo. That's uh, awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pull request. <laughs> Pull request. <laughs> uh, and um, <coughs> I hope that the demo makes things clearer. So far, any questions before we jump into demo? Yeah. What's the <laughs> DDD CQRS ES. Okay. Always with a slash. <laughs> Our questions regarding the topic, maybe? Okay, great. Okay, then uh, we will jump right in. I love this feature. Is that a bullet Is that a bullet Okay, so um, when we. <coughs> start on, on the Azure portal, that's pretty much what we get. Um, for people who haven't seen the portal, this is when you log in, this is kind of what you get. Just a little bit less on the left side, um, and an empty, more or less empty dashboard. Um, I've prepared this dashboard to have everything that we are using in this demo. So what we're going to do is like, um, we have functions that take an HTTP request for a vote coming in, for registration of a voter, uh, and for a um, referendum. And because we're doing DDD and CRS, what we do is we have commands that take those and uh, put them into events and store the events in a pretty simple implementation of an event store. Uh, so the the implementation of it of the event store that I have here is really simple. It's nothing uh, complicated. I didn't take the time to create a sophisticated event store. Uh, pretty much has a partition key, which is the name of the event. I will zoom in. Um, it has a row key to make sure that we don't get any duplicates. The, um, we have uh, a version here at the end that is always going up as soon as a new version of the event is created. 
pretty pretty simple, <laughs> not very sophisticated. <laughs> okay, so this is all stored in the table storage in the Azure table storage, which is pretty kind of fast for what we are doing. It is uh, good enough, and um, after our our events are created. What we do is we have another uh, we have another function that picks up the events and creates projections out of them and puts them aside into a document DB. And then, which is not yet implemented, we can have another function that uh, is another HTTP function that takes a request and just uh, returns the projection for the different devices that we have, right? Okay, so let's get into the functions. When we open up functions, maybe before we do that, I will show you how it looks when you, for the first time, create a function. Go here on the plus and say function app. There it is. Zoom in again. And we get asked a few things. We have to first select the function app here. And then down there somewhere. Just a quick question: Is it yeah. uh, Azure? Is it thirty days or ninety days? Uh, thirty days. Thirty days. Thirty days. Dep it depends very much on. You can get more if you like ask them. If you make a good negotiation with them, they're giving you more time here. So then we first need an uh, app name, which is the name of our function app, not of our function. It's important to say that all functions inside a function app share the resources. So we're talking about a hosting plan. I can have different hosting plans for different function apps, right? OK, so we can take DDD, um, Adam, Adam, right? doesn't like underscores. And then create a resource group, DDD Adam, whatever. And then here we can say if we want a consumption plan on episodes. Plan. So there's one thing that I forgot to mention is with when you choose your own app service plan, this is pretty more or less new. It's not really new, but no one uses it. There's an app service plan. So most of the app service plans are hosted on Windows. I get a Windows VM underneath. But there is one for Linux, <coughs> where I get a Linux underneath, which is good to know if I'm doing Node.js and I have some dependencies that only run on Linux, <coughs> not on Windows, uh, I can use an app service plan with a Linux machine underneath. So it's yeah. going to be the only one that's offered eventually. Sorry? Eventually, that's the only one that's going to be offered. No, I don't <laughs> think so. Um, uh, as, long, as long as, 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 as soon as uh, .NET Standard 2 is there, maybe. But uh, <coughs> until then, still a lot of people are doing C Sharp. But funny thing is like uh, all the documentation on Azure Functions and even other app services are provided first in Node and then in C Sharp. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> even the SDKs are more up to date in Node than in C Sharp. So. Maybe you want to change it, I didn't suggest it. <laughs> did, they, did they charge you for uh, Windows uh, infrastructure? Well, yeah. <laughs> they license yeah. But, but not for the Linux node. Well, it depends. Um, if you choose uh, Red Hat underneath or Azusa, you have to pay licenses too. Maybe I choose Ubuntu or something? Ubuntu or something, you're free of charge, yeah. Is it, which ones does it have? Ubuntu, CoreOS, and. For the app services? Yeah. They have just one, but they don't oh. say which one. Okay. Uh, I think it's a um, CoreOS, <coughs> but I'm not sure. Probably is. And you can it tell is. from the from the from the nightly upgrades if it's just hidden that it's it's just Windows underneath because <laughs> it takes hours. Or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, what they do is uh, pretty smart. So if you choose an app service plan, what you get is two app service plans without you knowing it, uh, because they do always the updates on a one machine and then they switch them. Uh, yeah, so we take the consumption plan, and we're not in so uh, South Central US, we are in Canada. Central. Central. Uh, they only I think they have two data centers in Canada. 
Um, and then we need a storage because all our code and everything is based on a storage somewhere, right? It's safe there. And newly since yesterday, they introduced um, keeping the secrets also on the storage and not on the VM because I can activate encryption for the storage and all kind of things. I'll leave the name Adam BA. <laughs> 37? What, uh, yeah. what is that? Automation option? Is it? Here? No. Yeah, right at the bottom. Oh, damn. It doesn't actually. This one? Sorry? Oh, just one more. Sorry? Oh, just one more. Just what, what did you mean? Oh, yeah, because automation of the dash. Right option. Right. Oh, automation option. Okay, automation option. Um, this is if I say automation options, then I will get. I'll zoom out. The code that I need oh, to I provision those provision. those so resources. You can put that in Gradle. Yeah. You can put that in Gradle. Uh, I'm not sure if Gradle. I think Gradle can handle them, but there are different ways. So there is a REST endpoint that you can call and give him the file. There is a, a PowerShell script, which is actually doing nothing else than calling the REST endpoint. And um, there is a for. Node, there's also Node CLI, Azure CLI, where you can give it the automation script and he will create it. But be careful with the automation script. It's not that sophisticated <laughs> as it seems to be. <laughs> there are still a few things that you need to get around it. But you can, if you have problems there, you can talk to me. Uh, we can talk about it. Okay. okay, so when we say create now, we are right to dash. So th this is one thing that is weird on Azure. Um, since there are a lot of different groups creating the different services in Azure, every one of them has their own ways of setting up um, requirements. Like for, for, ta for a storage, uh, the name is not allowed to be longer than, I think, 23 or 24 characters and not less than 13 characters and doesn't has to be all in sm uh, small letters and there are no dash so nothing allowed. On the other hand, there are other things where this is allowed. Um, and you can also see that when you look uh, how at the, at the roadmaps, at the product roadmaps. One team is doing it in Trello, the other one is doing it on GitHub, the third one is doing it somewhere else. So it's kind of, Microsoft is really opening and every team can choose what they want to do. At least it seems like it. Like but under the hood, it's all Microsoft Teams services or whatever? No, it's not. It's not. Are you Actually, sure? yeah, yeah. Because um, when you look into the, into the GitHub issues, they're really, for some, for some things, they're right now looking into moving from Jenkins to Travis. They lost their soul. Yeah, kind of. Okay, so DD Adam, this was the one that we created. And as we can see, the, the it is pretty empty. Actually, this is the new portal they just released a few weeks ago, which is still buggy. <laughs> and last night we had a big discussion with the team because there is one guy in the team that is always always pushing new updates without testing them so everyone was <laughs> last night really pissed off because nothing so worked you're in touch with the developers there on the other on github okay. on github yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> github and twitter yeah, yeah. um if you have enough people trying out then yeah. they're reacting good <laughs> I actually saw the Twitter exchange. Yeah, it's not, it's not, it was really, yeah, last night everyone was involved and uh, it was really fucked up because nothing worked. Okay, so what I get here, this is, I'll zoom in again. This is my function app and in here I can have multiple functions. Um, we'll get to the right side in a bit. Let's start with the function. I'm going to say here function. This is also a new I don't like this new uh, layout. I will go to the old custom one. It's uh, much nicer to see. So let's zoom out again. Uh, it's kind of bad. I will kind of maybe at least a little bit. Okay, so I can choose what language I want to do, right? Um, let's just for for now go on C sharp and all scenarios 
So um, you can see here, I have a blob trigger, event hub trigger, external file trigger, that were the things that we were talking about. I only have a look here at the external <coughs> file trigger and go here on to new. What we will see is here something that is called API. When I open this one, oh, actually, it changed a lot. So it's all done through the uh, UI. As a programmer, it's, I'm screaming inside. I want to okay. do things on the command okay. line. Okay. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to show, because you were like FTP, <laughs> there's more than FTP. OK, let's, let's, um, okay, then let's uh, jump into code. Uh, just one last thing before we jump into don't, the code. Don't, don't, don't let him troll you. This is beautiful. <laughs> I like the UI. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not just that. You need to know what the heck you're looking for. <laughs> okay, just uh, let me just say there are things like this image resizer where they have set up all the code already. So you can start it. It's a boilerplate code and it works. Um, there's also a manual trigger and a scale and a time based trigger. Someone wants to do uh, kind of a job thing, right? <coughs> and this is the whole point. So Azure Function is nothing else than the Azure Web Job SDK underneath. All the things that are coming in Azure Functions are from the Web Job SDK, <coughs> which is open source uh, on GitHub. And also the portal is open source on GitHub, so you can install it on your own machine and use the whole uh, portal on your own machine. Okay, but uh, let's jump into code. So we will so get. So all those are available in all the languages. All sorry. Those, all those entry points. Yeah, more or less all of them. <laughs> more or less all of them are available in all languages. Um, there are still bugs, but this is because, like as I said, like for Python, the full support is not there yet. It's still in preview, right? For JavaScript. For JavaScript, yeah, almost everything is there. Um, but let's see, direct, let's go directly into the code as I wish. So we have this DDD nota function here. And there you can see I have my function app, which is called DDD nota, and I have four different functions, which are actually the commands that are in nota. I just took them from the commands that are in nota. And um, when we go into one of them, so when we click one of them, what we see is like on the right side, we have the code. And as you can see, this is node JavaScript code. And on the right side, we have here some things that are called uh, view files, tests, and keys. want to look first through the code. Or no, before we start with the code, let's look into the integrate. Um, because this is where it's defined how it's going to be called how it's going to be triggered. So we have an HTTP trigger here. It looks odd because I zoomed in. I want to zoom out for a second, so you guys see that. Okay, that's what it actually looks like. Um, so we have an HTTP trigger up here. We have an input binding that is Azure st table storage. And we have uh, two outputs, uh, HTTP and Azure event type. So the idea is, whenever we get a command, we don't want to lose that command. So what we do is, we put that command into the event hub. So that at some point, if something went wrong, we can go and say, like, from the event hub, go two days back and reply all the commands again, please. Right? So um, this is the four things we have. And it's important to see what we do here. As you can see, this cast vote command takes a referendum ID and a voter ID. And this is here part of the route template, right? So I'm putting it into the route and tell them, OK, whatever comes there behind the slashes, um, this is actually put this into, I want to use this, put this into some variable that I can use. And on the other hand, I have here the request parameter name. Um, we'll see the REQ in the code. I will have a look here. As you can see, there is the REQ. So this is how we tell him how to bind it, to where to give it to, right? On the other hand, we had the referendum IDs. So as you can see, we can say request parameters referendum ID. Request parameters voter ID. So we can directly access them. We don't have to 
parse the URL ourselves or, uh, ourselves or do anything else. And also with the request body, we can access the body directly. If this would be C sharp, we could just put voter ID or referendum ID as parameters here. He will solve uh, the parameters itself himself. Okay, so what we do is like this is the just copied from the nota source all the uh, validation that is going on, and then in the end we're creating this object cast vote, which is the command, and just putting it into the event uh, event type. And as you can see here. I'm using on the context the bindings.outputEvents. Bindings.outputEvents is also defined here. When we choose our events, we can see here, I call it the parameter just output events, And this way, I can just access it. And I'm just assigning the message that I want to put into the event up to it. And he will take care of everything himself. Um, when we go now back to the code and go to this test uh, tab here, over here, I can see, okay, he realized, so the portal realized um, that I have two parameters in my uh, URL and he puts it in here and I give him some values and there I can do um, set my request body. And then we have right down here somewhere a run button that we can hit and this is the cold start and as you can see here function started and it took like three seconds this is a cold start of a node function if I run this again I can see it was just 30 milliseconds right. if I run it now again <laughs> You can see it's even, yeah, around, always around uh, 50 and uh, 30 milliseconds. So after it's warm, it's going to be fast. What happens is, as soon as you start a function, Azure is going to run it, and then he's going to not terminate it, but suspend it. And then wait to see if there's another call coming. If not, after five minutes, it's going to be terminated, right? So he's re reusing it and using connection pool in there. So we put now, we did, we put some messages now into our uh, event hub. Sadly, we can't see them because they've already been picked up. Or I could now start the uh, event hub explorer, or the, the service bus explorer, there yeah, we could see them. You guys want to see the event hubs? Uh, the, what is in the event hub? Yeah. Okay. Let's start that thing. I'm not sure where it is. Rel you Are you using the event hub as the event store? No. No, okay. As a command store. Okay. Just a queue of commands to process, okay. right? I'm using the table storage of the event store. Yeah. <coughs> so this is the service bus explorer. I can give it a connection string. Uh, and I don't know the connection string, so this is, by the way, our event hub, and we can see here there are messages coming in. Uh, I'll take. I root manage shared access key. Tell them I only need event hubs. It's a bit faster. Now. So I'll zoom in again. So now I have here my nota commands. So the thing with the event hub is like it is based on service bus, so we can't just peek into it. We have to create a listener that is looking into it. Right now, I only have one consumer group, this is default. And my other function is already listening on that consumer group, so I have to first turn off the other function before I can 
Look into it. You can only do one listener at a time. Per consumer group. Per consumer group. But you can have as many consumer groups as you want. Um, Now we should be able to create a partition listener and then tell him to start. And as you can see here, I'll get all the events with the time when they were enqueued. And uh, I could now just pick up the event that I wanted to take. Or look here. This is <coughs> what we put in, right? We put a command with the command name cast load, put a referendum ID, a voter ID, and uh, the phrase yes, we can from the poll. And when we now look again at our function, then we can see if we take away all the validation and stuff. It all comes down to this one line of code where I just say let us do it in a better This is actually the Visual Studio code in a browser kind of thing, right? Um, so it comes down to this line of code where I just Wow, first time that just happened. Okay, so where it's loading? That I have, where I just take whatever is coming from the request directly, put it into uh, that object, and put this into the event type. Right? And this is scaling perfectly, because if it is running, and I fire another command, and another command, and another command. It's just spawning a new function, a new function, a new function, and just does it all the time. It does matter. Um, the throughput of an event hub is a million per second, right? Um, and even if that is not enough, I can <coughs> scale there. I can scale the event hub. So it's, I don't need to take care of everything. And I'm actually just paying this 30 millisecond that the uh, function was running, right? Before we had like, everyone had to set up their servers, VMs whatsoever, or even on app services, their app, and we had to pay the whole month, even though we were just rarely called maybe, right? Because it's a, it's a startup, the app isn't owned by so many people, I'll still have to pay the whole thing, right? Okay, so what happens next? Our message is grabbed from the uh, from the uh, ev uh, from, from the event hub, and when we go in our function that does this, which is this one, nota uh, command incoming. As you can see here, there is already a message, and it it already picked up the yes we can from the portal because it was enabled. So this function is listening to one of the bugs of yesterday evening. Uh, this function is listening on the event hub and as soon as the message arrives in the event hub he's picking it up and processing it. And this is what, what he did here. When we look at the processing times I don't think here. it's like a 20 milliseconds that it took to pick up the message from the event hub and do a switch case on it to see what command is it and to create the event and put it into the event store. Right? The code isn't the best. I actually <laughs> I did it extra um, in a way that you can see it. But what is also important, this is C sharp code. This is not node. Um, I can mix inside a function app, I can mix whatever language I want to use. Maybe I have a team that likes to write some things in Node, maybe I have a team that likes to write some things in F-sharp, another that likes C-sharp, 
right? I can create a function app and have all these things. Maybe it's just because C sharp does something better than Node, or Node does something better than C sharp, right? So I can use whatever I want. So the, uh, the earlier on, uh, the, the, the validations, if these fail, it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, st it, it would reject the command. Yeah, it would. Actually, this is why we had this um, HTTP output binding, <coughs> because then we are returning HTTP uh, 505 or whatever we want. Right now, it's throwing an error. Would that go back to the call uh, part? Of yeah, this is the. So when you have an HTTP trigger, you always get the return value. You always ah, get the return, okay. right? Only works for HTTP. So you set it up so that the outbound had both, and then that you yeah. handy. You can do that. You can have yeah. multiple. You can have multiple inputs, multiple outputs. You can have ten different inputs if you you're saying like, uh, I need something from that database, from a SQL database. I need something from an Oracle database, and I need something from a storage table, right? You can all bring it in. As soon as your function starts, you have it all there. So what he does here is like creating that event, putting that event into the event store. But this such a dependency like when you're dealing with it. OK, um, I have it up here. So uh, do you guys, uh, so who is C Sharp? Uh, who knows C Sharp? Uh, who knows C Sharp script? Okay. C Sharp what? Well, script. <laughs> Sorry? What's the difference? I mean, yeah, the, uh, the difference is uh, that no C sharp script is not compiled. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. It's so um, is it the same syntax. And yeah, kind of. W whenever you have seen F sharp, for example, where people put in stuff and then they go like mark it, uh, select it, and then they go uh, control alt or control enter or whatever, uh, this is the REPL, and now you get into the C sharp too. This is the C sharp script where you can just run it right away. It's more interpreted than compiled. It, like everything else, it, trans it, it transpiles it into, into JavaScript? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so you just write it in JavaScript? Yeah. 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 Okay. Is that what it's doing about transpiling them? No, I was no, kidding. No, 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 and with the R, the reference here, I can reference uh, assemblies that are there. If I would use NuGet, right, yeah. I don't need the R anymore because he knows uh, he knows himself. Okay, this I need to reference this because it's in the dependencies. Where did you set anyway. up the NuGet though? Were you saying, hey, these packages? Oh, um, are I don't need it for things that are included, like Newton's of JSON. Well, what do you mean? It's included as part of, like, just on the portal? Or uh, like the no, it's part of the Azure function. As I said, okay. Azure function is running on Azure web jobs, and yeah. web jobs have Newton's soft included. Okay, so it's just big. Yeah, yeah it's it is just yeah. there for, for functions, at least. But if you, like, have your own NuGet package that you would like to use, yeah. um, you, you, create a, you create just a file, a packages.config, put in the... Uh, uh, the NuGet package dependency that you want to have, and he will automatically see, oh, there's a NuGet, uh, okay. there's a package right. config, I need to download it. Um, and yeah, and if I would have now something else that is not referenced, I can just reference it and then just use the using, and then I can go ahead. Right. So the coolest part about functions is, as you can see here on the left, Actually, this is just a folder where I have two files. One file is the function JSON. This is what we had earlier. This is the description of my trigger and my bindings. Right? It's a JSON file that is describing just how things are um, bound to the function. And, and then I have this run CSX, which is my actual code. And this is kind of it. So if I want to deploy a function, I just need a folder having those two files. I copy it there, and it is deployed. That's it. He'll pick up himself the function JSON and understand their fix. And there's another file called host JSON, 
can stay empty but if you want to use it um, you can control like how big is the queue that he's picking up maybe you don't want to have like every message out of the queue but you want you want him to wait to pick up like a hundred messages from the queue and then start the function um, you can control other things over this file too and then you can create as many folders as you want and put in like shared code this is what I did with the .csx files that I had here right these are C sharp script I'm just loading this later in my script and then using it right away so I can create folders I can put code in there and just re reuse it can you reference this one another? I, I did that this is the uh, electronic admin created event. Election. Uh, election, right. And when we look into the create here, you can see shared events election admin created. But it's just one function app that can use this. No, no, I can use it in Yeah, I, I think I have it even in the other one too. Yeah, there it is too. Is there a way you can sort of load these files, like in batches or something? Because if you imagine, like, if it's a coding, I have to change it three files, and then, like, change one file, copy it. No, copy no. Paste. Actually, what you, what, what you can do, yeah, what you can do is you can tell functions. This is, this is not function specific, but this is Azure App Service specific. You can tell an app service, hey, listen, there's my SCM, so there's my uh, source repository. Whenever I do a commit, grab it from there and copy it yourself. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'll be right? this yeah. It, it, <laughs> and it, so you can set it up for GitHub, for Bitbucket, for Visual Studio Team Services, for any Git repository there is. Or you can also say, hey, you know what? I don't want to host a Git repository myself. Give me a Git repository. Then Azure is going to host uh, within your app service the Git repository and give it to you. And then you can use a nice feature here on the left. So when you make a change, he will show you, hey, you have an uncommitted change because you made it in this uh, online browser, uh, online editor, sorry. Um, and then you can just commit it right away from there. Do you put a PowerShell script to... No. Anytime when you put, dump it into GitHub? It will automatically picked up, yeah. Where's the automation coming from? Uh, Kudu. There's a project called Kudu. Kudu? Kudu, yeah. Kudu is running underneath on all Azure app services. Oh, okay. And Kudu is installing... Sorry? Can you use Dockers? Dockers, Dockers for, for? To, to manually update, uh, to, to uh, automate the update. Why would you use Docker? I, I don't... Maybe I, I PowerShell. Don't know what I'm saying. Sorry. Oh yeah, PowerShell. No, no, no. PowerShell. Yeah, yeah. You you can. So what you can do is you can. That's what I wanted to say. So Kudu is installing actually um, a webhook on your GitHub. Yeah. So it gets notified by GitHub as soon as a, as there is a commit. Yeah. Um, but what you can do is you can customize Kudu. So you can tell Kudu. Listen, this is my build script, or this is my test script, or whatsoever. Uh, when you get the source, when there is a check-in, please get them, run this build script, run this test. And if it was all successful, only then deployed. What you also can do is working with deployment slots. So you can have your whatever CI you're using, like let's say Jenkins or Travis or whatever, Team City. And then you can let it um, deploy to a deployment slot. Then make all your production tests or your acceptance tests. And if it was all good, just swap the two slots. What, ba what is happening then is basically he's just uh, redirecting the DNS entry to the other slot. <laughs> so you have no downtime, nothing. So before you do the bill, you got to test it, right? You should, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you use another tool like Grunt? Uh, you can use Grunt. You can use um, so for Node.js, you can use whatever testing environment there is. For C Sharp, since it's C Sharp script, it's a bit more complicated. Then you would be better if you use the pre-compiled functions because they're using a full experience, like a full <coughs> build and everything, <coughs> and not. Um, are not integrated at a time but uh, for all those kind of things there are solutions uh, but like 
for everything there are a hundred solutions you got to figure out for yourself what is the best way to go there okay so our function is now getting the command creating the event and putting the event into the event store the same time what we do because there is no trigger for uh, a storage table what we do at the same time is we write to a queue. It's not zero here. Okay, for some reason I can't show you that, but I can show it here. So we write to a queue. We write to a queue to a storage queue uh, with the queue name event created. And then we have a number function that does nothing else than having a trigger on that event created queue having an inbinding on the document DB and having another queue as an outbinding and then uh, storage table as an outbinding um, as an inbinding sorry as you can see here here the direction says in or out actually there is a direction that is not documented but that is available that is in out but it doesn't work for everything um, it's not documented so don't use it so this function does nothing, it's also very simple since we have right now only one projection, right? So it creates a projection on our events that are then um, accessible through the document DB for the several clients. Let's say we would have a um, web client and mobile client and a WPF client whatever right <coughs> so we can set them up create different projections for them and everyone can have their own projections all based on the same events that we get in um, this separates uh, the the command and the query which brings us back to CRS right and what we would do also here is for the uh, for the notify output um, queue is now we're writing into another queue hey a uh, new projection was created and the next function would pick up this queue from this queue a new new projection was created and would send out all the notifications right using notification hub using um, service bus topics for signal R or whatsoever and this way we have separated like everything so everything is its own small little function we the concerns are really small the code to overview is really small um, they are async so they are there is no they are stateless to say there is no state with them so they can be called as often as we like to they can be um, scaled as we wish to and uh, we get the best performance that we can out of it. So to, to, to tell you a few things from experience about functions. <coughs> functions is awesome, I like them, I love them, I do a lot with them. Actually I wrote for, for the normal talk that I have on functions, I created an uh, Xamarin apps that is having a functions backend. So the whole backend for the Xamarin app is based on Azure Functions works perfectly nice um, but there are a few things that are still a bit weird there are sometimes they deploy a version that is not that good tested and then something just stops working but there is a setting uh, where you can just go and say I want to use an earlier version Right? I don't want to be on the li latest version. Do you have a choice where you can say, don't ever give me a version other than the one I want? Yeah. When you okay. put in a version number, it stays like this. Okay. If you put in a tilde and a one, you use everything with one and what comes okay. armor with one. Right? There's a beta, for example, you can go for beta. A funny thing, if you put in beta, he's telling you that you're not on the newest version. <laughs> so it's confusing sometimes. Um, on the other hand, as I said last night, some guy just deployed a new version because he thought it's cool and it wasn't tested. So there are a few pitfalls, there are a few um, issues, um, but 
overall it works very fine. We have it uh, at a company in a much bigger scale um, where a lot of ETL is involved, um, so data processing, and we use, for example, uh, other Azure services like Stream Analytics, which is nice for data processing. Uh, if you're doing like on a big scale data processing, like having different projections at the same time into different uh, outputs. <coughs> and Stream Analytics is awesome for this. Yeah. If you have any other questions to this, uh, or don't have any other questions to this, I would show you the last few parts that are not function specific, but that make functions yeah. even a bit cooler. Okay, so another thing that comes with every app, service <coughs> app, are the so-called settings. Um, here they're called platform settings, uh, platform features. Ah, no worries. Um, and the platform features. Oh, I hate it. I have to, sorry. I have to. Okay. There are a few things involved. First, we have here what is called advanced tools. As you can see, this is the Kudu. On the Kudu console, I can access uh, the whole file system where everything is hosted on. I can see my files, I can see other files, um, I can see even IAS files if I need to, or Windows files on the, off the machine if I need to, if I really need to go there. Don't touch them, but if you really need to. The App Service Editor is the bigger editor that we just saw. Um, I have diagnostic locks, so I can turn on the diagnostic locks and I will get like all the web server logs that are involved, right? If I want to see all the IIS logs, I can activate them there, and then I can, in the log streaming, see, see what's going on there. Process Explorer is really a process explorer, so I can see what processes are running on my machine, uh, what might uh, use a lot of resources. Deployment credentials and deployment options, those are the things that we talked about, like setting up GitHub or uh, Bitbucket or whatsoever. Um, push notifications are the Azure uh, notification hub things that, that I was talking about, so I can use that to send push notifications to different devices. Authentication and authorization, this is a cool thing. If I click this, so first before we get into this, every function is secured. I have always, if I want to run a function, there's always an API key, unless I go and say this is an anonymously callable function. And I can do that on function app level and a function level. I can create uh, as many keys as I want to. If I don't want to use this, if I want to use something cooler, I can go with this authentication authorization panel. And when I say on, as you can see here, I can set up my own AD or Facebook or Google or Twitter or Microsoft account. And then, whenever someone wants to run one of my functions, like through HTTP uh, call, he has to provide a beer token, an OAuth 2 beer token, from one of these that I sign up here, set up here. Right? So I can make it all secure, especially you guys from security over there, <laughs> as Adam mentioned. Um, this might be interesting. I can also say, Okay, if someone is not logged in, so if he doesn't provide credentials, what should I do? Should I allow anonymous requests? Or should I log him to Facebook, send him to Facebook so does he, that he does log in and then comes back or to Google or whatever? I can also, if I choose Azure, uh, Azure Active Directory, I don't have to have my own Active Directory the way we know Active Directory. I can just set up here kind of express, and then I get an Active Directory, create a new AD, which means I can even provide 
sign up and log in and everything for my own users. It doesn't have to be a real Active Directory. Underneath, he's just using Azure Active Directory to manage your users. Okay, um, this is for the authentication part. Oh. Discard this. Uh, yeah, application settings. Right now, so there's a cool thing in Azure that is called Azure Key Vault. And I don't know if you guys know that, but it is pretty cool. So I can put secrets, certificates, and even keys or um, certificates to create keys or hardware dongles. I can put them into that key vault. And whenever someone or an application wants a secret or a password or whatever, he has to authenticate himself against the Azure Active Directory and only if he is valid and he is allowed to have it, he's getting the key or the password. Where is that stored? Is that on? It's on Azure. So if the CIA wants it, they can get it? I don't know. <laughs> well, it depends. If you're using your, well, if you use your hardware dongle, your own hardware dongle, no. Okay. Right? You, you, you're talking about the RSA <laughs> key, right? Yeah. But what you can do is, um, also with the key vault, you can do rolling key updates. Because the applications don't have the pass passwords within them, but they just get it from the key vault. <coughs> so you can roll the keys and change the keys uh, on Key Vault without anyone else uh, being involved or needing to, or any need to redeploy. <coughs> but right now, Azure Functions doesn't support Key Vault. <laughs> right? Well, right now, it's just if I'm, I'm working on it. Uh, right now, um, as you can see, all the connection strings and everything are stored in the application settings. And here's also the function extension version. Robert, right? Yeah. Um, and also down there I can say I want to use a different node version not a higher but a lower one <laughs> for example <laughs> well, that would be awesome yeah that would be <laughs> awesome right? I'm on version 9 so. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. and uh, when I'm not on a consumption plan I can actually um, have a, the platform set to 64-bit uh, or activate remote debugging doesn't make se much sense on um, functions if you're using C# -sharp script because right, it is uh, not really compiled. But you can do that. That manage pipeline is about that. Yeah. Uh, it's what do you know from the IIS? IIS, right? Yeah. Okay. But this is only so. The funny thing is, like somewhere here it says, yeah, here it says. You can only have this if basic plan or higher is activated. I think a year ago or something it said you can only have this if standard or higher was activated. And a year before that was kind of only premium and higher, right? <laughs> Even though there is a higher. Thing. So basic is like the most basic. I think there is a free, which is not basic, right? But since this is a consumption plan, this doesn't count. Okay, so um, one of the last things, and, and then we're kind of through. I can also bring in my own custom domains or SSL certificate. I don't know if this is, maybe this would be nice. Oh, interesting question for you. This is one of our yeah. clients is uh, going through this. Uh, things like Let's Encrypt and Azure. Yeah, this is what I wanted to show. Oh, okay, perfect, <laughs> good, I read your mind. Yeah, you did. <laughs> because they newly introduced that you can use like Let's search, Encrypt. search bot and all that, right? Hmm? Search bot and... Uh, yeah, I think... Mm -hmm. Is it here? No. So you can use Let's Encrypt and... Yeah, yeah, no. If, if you can show that right now, I can help one of our clients really well. I'm not sure if it works for the uh, consumption plan, no, but I can show it to you. putting it in one of the endpoint things on the outside oh. anyway. Uh, there's a problem with uh, the fact how, how uh, 
So that's that's encrypt works that has to originally cause to come back to the same instance to validate yeah. the certificate. And that doesn't I really work well with these. I have the same services. problem as as Adam has. Like it has to find the same thing. I'll send come back to it. We just went through this. It's a nightmare. Something, yeah, exactly. Something yeah, you have to reroute it explicitly. So That's right. you I have got, to. I got a, uh, like a, a URL from Amazon. Oh, you did? Oh, okay. So I don't think Azure gives you that. That's the problem. I'm not sure. Amazon just get the URL. Because we just we have to, we have to reroute well known on every single instance. Oh, really? And so what do you point it? Like you need your dot well known file routing on every instance because you don't know which one you're gonna hit on the way back in. Yeah, yeah. Security people will know. Yeah. Sitting behind. <laughs> they announced it really big. Yeah, there it is. Um, but they changed the problem. <coughs> they, you could you could set it up. You could set it yeah, up yeah, here. We can take it offline. Just All right, we'll, we'll take it offline. Yeah, yeah. But this is actually what I wanted to show. <laughs> Funny. You could set it up here, um, but this whole thing changed somehow. Okay. Anyway. Can you get an IPv4 address? Sorry. Can you get an IPv4 address for your? Yeah. You you get always an IP4 access. So you get always an IPv4 for your app service um, with an URL, but you can set up your own custom domain also. Right? You can set up your own custom domain, so it, this is the IP, IP, IP4 address. So if you want to want the functions to have your, your IP in it. There is something called proxies uh, in the functions. Um, we don't see it here anymore. It's over mm -hmm. here somewhere. Yeah. yeah, here. The proxies. Proxies is a nice idea that they had. It's like what you can do is you can pull together all your function apps and all your functions um, and put them in kind of a proxy so that they're all going through a proxy to get to your function. So that they all look like you can put version numbering in front of it and all that kind of stuff. Which is nice, uh, but it is pretty limited to what they can do. There's another thing in Azure which is called API management. This one is much more sophisticated and you can do things like uh, SOAP to REST, REST to SOAP, where you give it a WSDL, um, w WSDL and he creates the REST endpoints out of them and all that kind of stuff. Uh, this one is more expensive, but it is much more sophisticated and you can connect it to several different identity providers like uh, you can tell him hey, whenever this URL is called, go to that <coughs> one called that URL, but please use an Auth0 identity to do this and kind of stuff. So you can do a lot of it. it you get also a portal that you can put in the documentation of your API in them, all of kind of stuff. But when it comes to documentation, you can also create in or upload a Swagger spec for your function. So on the other side, the guys would get a swagger, swagger for your functions, for those who know Swagger. OK, I think that's pretty much it. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> Any other questions? Sure. Um, in the abstract, it said you were going to compare it to Amazon. Oh, yeah. And why this I, is so much better. I thought I did it, the bindings. <laughs> No, actually the bindings are one of them Then you can't have more than 300 concurrent running uh, lambdas. You don't have the limitation here. You have uh, much more support for different uh, languages more or less, right? They support also C Sharp uh, to some cases. I think no one of them supports Java. I've never seen a serverless framework that supports Java. I don't know why. But I've, I haven't seen it. And um, the API gateway, what's called on AWS, I think, it, I think it is a pain in the ass because you have to set it up for everything that you want to have 
after your lambda. Um, and in functions, it's just easier with the raw template. You just go in there and say, like, this is the raw that I want to have. It just works. Um, on the other hand, there are things that AWS can do so great that Azure can do, like an Alexa integration. But um, I've even run an Alexa on functions. It works, too. Uh, you can just set up Alexa to whenever you say something, he's calling a function and giving whatever you said uh, as a parameter to the HTTP call. Works too. And there is one thing that I hate about AWS Lambdas, and this is more a kind of, yeah, this is not really a technical thing, but more like a, I think the whole idea on serverless and stateless and all the kind of things is that you get rid of dependencies. So this is why I use for all the communication between the functions, I use some queues or some storages or whatever, right? I didn't call from one function the other function. Because if you start do calling from one function the other function, what you do is like you have a direct dependency on each other. So when this one scales, this one scales automatically too. Right? You get rid of, or you, you, you lose all the perfect scalability. And that you might wind up with a bit of a maintenance thing. For example, if you have the part which validates the command in one yeah. function, and the part which actually generates the events in the other, yeah. uh, that can be a bit of a problem to maintain it later, right? So how do you find in practice having this flurry of functions which all need to be, you need to know which ones actually belong together from a type counting this is, perspective? Yeah, and this is, this is the question. Is it, is it really yeah. like this? Because for me, when I have a look on this, the one function that is creating the events, it doesn't care, it doesn't care if it's coming from the other function or not, if the command is coming from there. But it doesn't really. It shouldn't really care. But you have two functions, right? Yeah. You, 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 it looks like you're kind of queuing your commands and you're validating before you queue the yeah, commands I, and then you do events. Yeah, I yeah. only queued yeah. the command so I can use the feature of replying them and to have more code to show. I could just okay. create the command. The, the um, I could just not yeah. create, uh, uh, not queue the command, yeah. but actually write directly, for example, into the event hub, right? Instead of doing HTTP yeah, yeah. call, mm -hmm. but this was just something that I just chose. Yeah, but this yeah. is this is um, that that's the thing it's for a the fundamental design. Thing yeah, it is. CKRS, it is. Whether yeah. uh, you queue commands or not, because they are things. That you, if some if some things fail in your yeah. command queue, it invalidates everything after. Yeah, you can't. Uh, with good conscience process the rest of the classic is of course payment processing right you cannot replay a process payment command so that kind of thing right you get the same dependencies so the well, same it depends why why yeah. can't you do that you because can't do you pay it. for the second you time well no oh, then right. you have then you have a problem because either you paid already then your event that you paid is already there yeah then the command that would like or when you when you have your um, when you check if you do the payment, really you have to check if the payment is done already. So if the co uh, if the event is created already, right? If the event is there, that that's only true if you if you have a payment processor that accepts a reference token. Yes. Yeah. Then they will reject it. Yeah, but, but that you can't guarantee for all. Well, payment this games. is this is on a payment uh, on a, on a, a payment processor side, right? If you do it on your side, if you payment created is stored in your event store. You can check if this event is created. If this event is created, payment is done. That's uh, right. In Nota, for example, you can't replay a cast vote event because it means you vote a second time and things like that. Yeah. So it's, uh, uh, this, this would be the point. The, yeah. point the, the point was simply, it seems that the, 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 the usual thing, it, it, it's very powerful, um, and, and the usual things around coupling and cohesion apply as always. Yeah. yeah. But uh, what I wanted to say uh, initially about AWS is like AWS actually has in their documentation um, they have functionality for one lambda to call another lambda. And this is what I don't like. But this is more kind of a feeling thing. I, I don't think it's the right way to, to work with stateless things. But directly? Yeah, wow. Directly without a queue between? Yeah, yeah. 
But they have queues. I mean, they have queues. queues. Yeah, you can use queues. <laughs> yeah. But I've seen a lot of people just doing it because it is available. Because yeah, yeah. you can yeah. do it, they start doing it. Yeah. yeah. And Especially if one of them runs longer. What's the limit than three yeah. minutes? And what, how do you do this? And this, is, this, is, this is so stupid. That's the thing. Right? <laughs> In the documentation of functions, you will see that they say, yeah, you, could, you can do an HTTP call to another function, yeah. but you shouldn't, right? But AWS has in their documentation, there is a separate part. They have uh, commands just to call another lambda out of the one line. And I think this is wrong, but again, <laughs> it's just me. OK, great. Other questions? Have you heard of Kubernetes Fission? It's just a word, nothing about it. No. But it's basically. It, it claims to be serverless, which can run on your own server. Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm gonna have it's always about running a serverless on idea yeah. here. Yeah. It is always <laughs> running a server. Well, yeah, okay, let's, let's talk Azure. about serverless. Yeah, well, serverless. So I think <laughs> what, in, actually it is a good thing, because yeah. um, actually yeah, what, cool. what does serverless mean? Yeah. Uh, the whole idea of serverless is they're not doing anything else than we did like years ago. This is not a new approach. <laughs> actually, some, some, yeah. someone that I was talking to, he was like, oh, actually, this is like a mainframe, right? If I need more power, I go there, open it up, put another device in it, close it, and I have more power, right? Yeah. I, I have another mainframe. So this is nothing new. But what is nice, not new, nice, is that it takes so much abstraction. When I'm talking to the database, I don't need to set up all the database communication. When I'm talking to uh, a file storage, I don't need to set up all the I.O. things that I normally would need to do. And this is where the phrase serverless comes from. I get a place where I can just start, like with the co-working space. I just go there, set my things up, and start right away, right? Basically, they're abstracting all the The abstracting of everything. All the infrastructure yeah. and the resources. Right. Uh, if you do this, actually, just to say it again, because of AWS and even Google and my, uh, IBM, uh, they have it too. Um, so if you go in AWS and you try to do something with the binding, just not possible. So if you want to talk to the S3 storage or to the database, you have to set up all the communication, like creating a connection to the database, grabbing the data, and all that. What I didn't show you, maybe this is. Oh, this is will this will make everything much much nicer. Um, so as I said, I have these this other function for the mobile backend, <coughs> and as soon as it loads, did you did you rip out the internet cable? Kind of? Nope. Oh okay, yeah, there it is. Okay, so I have here um, a function that is, as you can see here. Just for the record, our recommendation is to have a hybrid, dual cloud and on-premise solution with triple active redundancy. So yeah, well, I agree. <laughs> if you have a point of sale system and the internet goes down, yeah, I agree. How do you take payments, right? So but this is this, this is, is the thing that we didn't cover under, you know, yeah. for the new people around event sourcing. Yeah. How easy it is to synchronize oh, yeah. between cloud and local storage yeah. of and what your is, state is. This right? is actually great for it, right? Yeah, uh, you yeah. can synchronize both ways. Yeah, yeah. and this is also, uh, as I said, this is the um, functions is from day one available in Azure Stack. So, if you want to have this as your hybrid cloud solution in your data center, you can do, you do this too. So what I wanted to show you is like, I have another HTTP function here that is also having a, a URL with the country and plate here. But what is nice is this one. Is it, no, sorry. Oh, this one, yeah. This one also has That's my code. Sorry. Oh yeah. Forget what I said. This one. It's been a while. So this one has this route with the country and play the message ID. 
And what you can see here, when I scroll down a bit, is really interesting. So now I'm having an inbinding that is going to table storage, getting the data, and using as a partition key into row key what I have here with the curly braces. So what it does is, as soon as the function starts, I have already pre-filtered the data that is coming in from the database by automatically use it, taking it from the route, right? Nice. And these are kind of real bindings that you don't get in AWS. <laughs> and you can do that with uh, almost everything. There are <coughs> with the notification hub, there is right now um, a bug, uh, but you can also handle this if you, for example, when we see the code here, what you can always do, you can ask them for a binder. So these are the nice features that bind you to Azure, Azure so that yeah. you can't move your solution well, to Well, it is all Amazon on GitHub open right. source. <laughs> you can download it and run it on your yeah, own machine. Well, yeah, but yeah. not on Azure. It's very, very alluring. Well, yeah. you can <laughs> run it on Azure. This was a good idea that I had the other day. You can set up um, VMs on, on Amazon, on AWS, and then you can install functions there. It is, I mean, it's very alluring. Yeah, I think yeah. that they actually have something called the binder in it. It's yeah, a particularly yeah. nice touch. <laughs> yeah, there is, there is a binder. So you can ask for a binder and then you yeah. get a binder. Yeah. And then what I do here is just set up a notification hub attribute. So normally this would have been an attribute before my notification binder. And there I can just use it. After I say binder bind async, I can just use the client. Uh, right away. This is what happens normally underneath when there wouldn't be this bug. <laughs> um, another nice thing about this is when we look here at another C sharp, was it, was it this one? Yeah, okay. So, as you can see here, this is an HTTP call from C sharp side, and I have here country and plate which are also part of the URL, right? And I have here some I collected. What I can do, so in C Sharp, if I use string here, if I use string here, he will give me the body of the request. But I can say HTTP uh, request message. And he will automatically knew, know that I want to have the whole object, not just the body. And he will give me the body. Um, I don't need to change anything else, just the type. And then I get like all the information from the HTTP call. So as you can see, um, it is good. Uh, it makes it's a lot of fun. Um, just to wrap it all up in my last slide, I hope it comes there. Uh, no, it doesn't. Um, where I know Yannick sent it to me. But I don't know where. Let me. I think it's in. Where does Slack put all the files? I think in downloads, right? Probably in Azure. <laughs> yeah. Slack? No, I don't think so. Um, okay, I don't have. Just, uh, just to say, um, Azure Function costs. So you get the first two million calls for free. And then they have this weird thing that is called gigabyte seconds. So you're paying gigabyte seconds. This means the number of memory that you're using, RAM that you're using for the function, and the, the time that the function is running. One gigabyte second costs um, 15 cents or something less no 0 0.015 cents but this means that your function actually needs to use one gig of ram and run for a second right so i don't know what about you guys but when i think back like applications using so much ram yeah functions using so much ram must be either uh, media processing <laughs> or um, 
I don't know, some, something is wrong there. And so now it's the minimum they charge, right? One. Yeah. Th this is the finest. Yeah. Okay. And um, you're paying per call and for the time, how often it is running, and so on and so forth. And now remember, two thousand euros he paid. <laughs> so you can imagine how much. There's a lot. I think it it was like December or something. They must have felt like in California or something. What about database uh, science? Sorry? Database science as you Yeah, this, this is something else. This has nothing to do with uh, functions. This is depending on the Azure SQL database or That's a separate whatever. Thing. Yeah, this is a separate thing. Yeah, so this is a separate charge resource. Charge by the gigabyte yeah. for that. There's a DTU. The German thing. expression for that would be dust costed extra. <laughs> All you need to understand is the word extra. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Maybe just the like we're using the SDS build and release pipelines. Is there any special tasks or like release or build tasks that you need? No, Obviously only for uh, there is yeah functions. for the compiled features it's just C sharp compilation. Just there is nothing and special. And then you can in the function JSON, mm -hmm. you can give him hey uh, my starting point is that assembly and that method in that assembly. And then you just need the function JSON. You don't need to run CSX anymore. Right. Would you unit test this through like yes. regular unit tests? Yeah. Well, if you if you do pre-compiled C sharp, yeah. yeah, normal unit test there. If you do Node.js, unit test there. Well, this is I would back to the yeah. advantages of event sourcing and CKRS that you can easily write yeah. unit tests anywhere. And uh, there's no mocks or anything like that involved. Yeah, for me it's more like how is it fitting into the build pipeline that we already have. Right, right, right. What you can do is Azure has for almost everything that they have there. So for document DB, for the storage and so on and so forth, for all the kind of things they have emulators. Yeah. You can run up the emulators, uh, that's what we did on our build system, running up the emulators. And uh, the cool thing about the emulators is or about the storage emulator is at least you can predefine the file. So let's say for every test you need a basic setup always, right? Mm -hmm. You can predefine it and then you can uh, put it on the server too. That's yeah. definitely for your case, um, looking at functions versus entire VMs, much more. As and we don't do VMs, we do app, ser uh, app, app services. services kind of oh, thing, okay. so okay. a little bit closer to it, but still, yeah. Because these are like built-in triggers that yeah trigger these functions, you somehow have to get to them, right? Mm -hmm. For a test. Honestly, underneath, he is polling. Yeah. Underneath, he is polling. So there is no secret, push yeah. <laughs> So you're basically populating your emulator and then it's kind yeah. of triggers. But you can look, as, as I said, the um, sources, it's actually one of the better sources I've seen. <laughs> Um, the source is open, you can see it on GitHub, uh, you can contribute, you can create issues, they take care. And also the source for the portal is separate. Um, it's an Angular portal. Angular? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some Sometimes I actually restart the whole browser before we everything can works. We can fork it and make a React. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. I'm in, I'm in. <laughs> totally. No. Can you develop offline? On Windows, oh. <laughs> on Windows, uh, right now Windows. But um, there is a ticket. They're uh, moving the whole. The problem is that the web jobs thing is still on .NET four or something. So they are lifting it all up to .NET standard two, and then it's. It doesn't more. run on mono at all. It runs on mono, but not that good. Uh, especially the emulators, since the emulators are yeah, missing. Yeah. Um, but with the .NET Core version that is coming up, it will run everywhere. Eventually. Eventually. <laughs> I have written some things that were more or less on different services. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any other question? Thank so. You. Thanks very Thank much. You. Yeah. Thank Thank you. You. I would have one more or two two questions that I always ask after uh, the presentation. So, who likes functions? Uh, 
And who will try it out? Like, try it themselves out. Awesome, cool. I actually will, because the interesting thing is also the use of Nota for it. It's actually possible that pretty much any of our standard apps, and when you look at Nota, it really is close to what we use for clients uh, routinely. We could actually okay. deploy it. Uh, we deployed in, uh, in, in in this context. Yeah. It's, it's actually quite interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See at local uh, events, obviously the local Azure uh, meetup. You're gonna probably uh, meet up with Jeff King and uh, and a couple other people that yeah. are heavily into that. So uh, please make sure to check out uh, meetup.com to see if you're interested where she is gonna be presenting next. And uh, uh, I'm guessing you're gonna leave your contact info on the meetup. Yeah, we'll sure. put that as a comment. Uh, also, the um, slides are oh, online yeah. on my GitHub. Oh, okay, perfect. So we can provide that link in, uh, yeah. in the, you know, as a comment in yeah. the meetup, and then everyone can go and uh, go to the meetup page and uh, get all that info. And, and um, if it's okay, yeah. I would upload the Nota things too. Yeah, it's, it's open yeah. source. So yeah. 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 <laughs> you can yeah. even fork it and uh, change yeah. it however uh, you want. Um, yeah, so our stuff is also open source, so you can look at Adaptech on uh, github.com. Github.com slash Adaptech Nota is there. Mm -hmm and uh, have fun with that, with the voting mechanism. Uh, just some closing things. Did you have anything to add, Robert? Yeah, just again, thank you very much for taking tonight's session. This was very interesting. A, a lot of things uh, uh, around. I never really looked at functions in Azure, especially that it turns out that our stuff uh, is really transferable directly into the function, into such an architecture. It's kind of, uh, it's interesting. Never thought about it that way. But it, it would work in Lambdas as well, yeah. uh, you can s almost see how you could yeah. automate porting it that way. Exactly. Yeah. We try to write code that yeah. runs everywhere, and it's fully compatible with yeah. this, which is great. Good to see that yeah. uh, Node is a first class, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, first class citizen. Uh, just some closing remarks. Uh, we usually try to go to Lamplighter afterwards, but that be it's actually very, very busy. So we've switched our place to go afterwards for a couple of beers to the Black Frog, which is a block west. And uh, some people are familiar with where that is. So <laughs> it, it, the Black Frog, Black and Frog. it's just be it's behind the Starbucks. So it's not right next door to Starbucks, but it's off water.